Tonight's panel includes uh, four esteemed experts in the in psychological interventions uh, for chronic pain management. Uh, they include um, Dr. Courtney Wells, who will also serve as tonight's discussion moderator. Dr. Wells is a researcher, educator, and licensed social worker passionate about improving the emotional and social health of people living with chronic health conditions. She is an assistant professor at the University of Wisconsin, River Falls. She sits on the Minnesota Arthritis Foundation Leadership Board and serves as the mental health director for the largest camp in, in the U.S., arthritis camp in the U.S. Uh, Courtney is also driven by her 35 years of experience living with both physical and mental health conditions. Uh, next, we have uh, Dr. Afton Hassett. Uh, Dr. Hassett is a licensed clinical psychologist and associate professor in the Department of Anesthesiology at the University of Michigan. She has published uh, over 100 peer-reviewed articles and is the leader in the field of resist resilience and pain research. Her work focuses on novel interventions to promote resilience and self-management for ind individuals with chronic pain. Uh, we have Dr. Wesley Gillum. Uh, Dr. Gillum is a licensed pain psychologist who specializes in clinically proven non-drug strategies to manage pain. He's a clinical director of the Adult Chronic Pain Rehabilitation Center at the Mayo Clinic. In his role, he focuses on the emotional, social, and psychological aspects of pain to reduce patients' reliance on pain medications. And lastly, but certainly, certainly not least, we have uh, Dr. Jennifer Steiner. Dr. Steiner is a board certified clinical health psychologist who specializes in evidence-based therapies for chronic pain, uh, including cognitive behavioral therapy and acceptance and commitment therapy. In addition to running her own private practice, she's the co-director of the Center for Mental Health and Aging Continuing Education Training Program. She is also a current adjunct professor in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences at Emory University. Um, thank you all for joining us tonight, and I'm going to hand it off to Dr. Wells to get this conversation started. Thanks, Robin. Hi, everyone. Very happy to be here tonight to talk to you about a topic that is very important to me and my work. We're gonna kick off the event here by discussing some terms that we use regularly in our everyday lives. And sometimes we use them correctly and sometimes we don't. And that's why we wanna make sure we're all on the same page about what they mean. So we're going to hear from our different speakers here about terms, emotional well-being, emotional health, mental health, emotional wellness, and resilience. And we will talk a little bit more about all of these as the evening goes on. Dr. Hassett, would you like to start by giving some definitions of some of these terms? Oh my goodness. Well, first of all, thank you so much for having me here. It's just such a pleasure to uh, be on this panel with um, these great uh, other uh, guests, as well as the um, individuals who are joining us from uh, around the country. Um, so there are no perfect definitions and there's a lot of overlap amongst these. And so it's a little, it's a little, um, up to the eye of the beholder. Um, I, I think maybe where I'm most comfortable is talking about resilience um, and how to define that. And so um, this is an area that I'm very interested in. And, and it's, it's really about our ability to bounce back given adversity. And so we accept that life is difficult. Things come our way and often they are very monumental challenges or tremendous losses or, or even traumas. And what resilience speaks to is our ability to weather the experience, whatever that might be. And it looks different for different people and different events will require different times and, and uh, resources to be able, be able to, to spring back. But the notion is that we all can do much in our lives to build our resilience so that when these things do come by, we have the resources, including the social support, the emotional and coping resources that we can better weather the, um, the event. Wonderful. Why don't we pass it off to Dr. Gillum to elaborate a little bit more? 
Sure. I'm glad Dr. Hassett started with resilience because that seems like kind of an umbrella term for a lot of these, a lot of these variables that are being discussed. You know, I might step down from there, talk a little bit about, you know, the idea of mental health. I, I, I think we tend to think of mental health as absence of, of mental illness. And I, I think that's a, a there's probably some level of truth to that, but it's a, a lot more complicated than that. So when we when we talk about positive mental health, you know, we're talking about uh, sort of a state of well-being where an individual is able to kind of realize their their abilities. They cope reasonably well with, uh, you know, normal day to day stressors. They they can work productively and fruitfully. They're they're actively engaged in their in their in their communities and making contributions. So there's a sense of purpose and and direction to life. And, and so mental health really includes emotional, psychological, social well-being. It, it affects how we think, how we feel, how we act, how we cope with life in general. And it's the byproduct of that is our responses to things like stress. And, and so it's fed in a lot of ways by, by our emotional well-being and, and, and our emotional health. And it, it's a, a predictor of, uh, it, it really does help to buffer us from challenges in our life that can result in things like depressed mood can result in anxiety. And, and even if somebody has those issues, it can also help to mitigate the extent of those symptoms. I'm so glad that you were talking about kind of mental health being, you know, more than just the absence of a, of a you know, psychiatric diagnosis or a psychological diagnosis. And I think that's really kind of at the heart of what all of these terms are really talking about, this idea of wellness being more than just the absence of something. It really has to do with your own awareness of all of the factors that could be affecting your either physical or in this case, emotional health. So like you said, how you deal with stress, how you manage um, your mood, how those things are playing a role in your physical health as well. Um, I've heard a lot of people talk about their sense of self as part of their emotional emotional and um, emotional wellness and mental health. And that can be really disruptive when we're talking about things like illness and pain. And so I think it's, it's really key that we're talking about this more in terms of um, how effective we are at managing our feelings and our responses to stress rather than just, oh, I don't, I don't have a clinical diagnosis of depression or something like that. Dr. Sander, could you follow up on that a little bit around sometimes people say I'm I'm so depressed or I'm so anxious, but they're not necessarily referring to that diagnosis. Could you just give a little more context around those differences? Yeah, absolutely. So I think everybody from time to time experiences the emotion of depression or the emotion of sadness in response to you know life events or situations. But when people are talking about being you know, having a diagnosis of a depression or being clinically depressed, which is an old term, um, they're really talking about feeling that way for an extended period of time. It's not just a couple of days in response to something. It's usually all day long or most of the day, every day, the definition is for at least two weeks. And it's not just the feeling of sadness or loss. It's often accompanied by other experiences, um, feeling less motivated, having just kind of less umph to get up and do the things that you used to enjoy. Um, you, you know, your appetite can change, your sleep can change, uh, your just general way of being in the world and thinking about yourself can change. All of those are really what is part of what we call clinical depression or a diagnosis of a major depressive disorder. Um, and that's different from just having the emotion, which is a completely normal and human experience. Um, now the emotion can develop into a major depressive disorder. And so it's important to kind of be on the watch for that. Um, but, but that's not necessarily the same thing. And the same is true of anxiety. Everybody experiences anxiety sometimes. Um, but when it starts to really, when either of these things start to really interfere with your day-to-day -day functioning, that's when we start to think about it as, well, maybe, maybe this is something more and that we need to attend to it a little bit more. Great. That's really helpful. May I add something? Um, completely agree. And I, I think what's interesting is um, what we talk kind of about our emotional well being and our emotional health, but also it's, you know, creating a, a little richer lexicon for our emotions, you know, the, the words that we use to kind of express 
um, how we feel. And I think that's why depression kind of becomes almost a shortcut for sadness. But um, I think the other point that I'd like to make is that human emotion is, is complex and, and interesting and it's not unidimensional. So we at any given time can have all sorts of emotions and, and people in their day-to-day -day life have some happy emotions and some, and some negative emotions. And, and this is really okay. You know, we, we know that having some amount of worry or concern or anxiety is, is pretty normal. But when you have a lot of positive emotions on board too, you know, kind of um, a little bit of joy and happiness and social support, it just makes it much easier to weather. You know, we do research about something called affect, affect balance or affect, affective balance style. And it's just the degree to which you have, you know, more positive emotions than negative emotions, or are you a type of person that tends to have more negative emotions and positive emotions? And the goal is not to get rid of all the negative emotions. The, the goal is to understand the negative emotions, to process them, and to build the positive emotions, to build a little greater, um, greater um, sense of resilience and, uh, and, and, and uh, um, an emotional buffering. I think somebody said buffering earlier, and that's just such a, a great term for how we, um, how we deal with the negative emotions. I think it's important too not to pathologize feeling down sometimes. And I think that can you know, get people, unfortunately, in the mindset where if I'm feeling bad, that's bad. And I shouldn't be feeling that way. And I, and so I think to be able to normalize that, to have dips in mood, to have increases anxiety periodically is part of the lived experience. And we all have them. Um, it's just along the continuum of how impactful is it, is it in your day-to-day -day functioning? I, I just absolutely agree to the point about how it affects your functioning. And I just wanted to chime in and say, you know, it is normal to have these fluctuations for everybody, no matter what your, your life situation is or what your stressors may be. But I also think that it can be especially common to have, you know, down days or anxiety ridden days when you're dealing with chronic pain and chronic illness. Um, and a lot of times those days that are a little bit more emotionally, um, heavy or emotionally challenging can go along with your bad pain days or your bad symptom days. And that's normal. That's part of the experience. I really appreciate all these complexities and nuances that you're bringing. I, it makes me think about if people have seen the movie Inside Out. That's one of my favorite tools to use to teach people about these emotions and how we can live with multiple different emotions at the same time and actually how some of the ones that are more negative can be used to get to some of the positive ones and how they're connected in that way. So I, this is really a good discussion about those connections. Now I'd like to move into talking a little bit about what are some of the things that can get in the way of our emotional well-being? What are some of those barriers that might come up? We can go ahead and start with Dr. Hassett again if you want to well, thank you. Um, so something that seems really prominent in, um, in people who have chronic illnesses and chronic pain is where they make a decision to have to do or, or to do the things that they have to do, where these must do duties are prioritized to the, um, to, to the exclusion of doing the things that we love to do. And, um, and, and boy, does it, it make sense. And I don't have an easy solution for this one because you, know, you have to survive. You, know, you have to go to work, you have to do the errands, you have to you know, take care of the kids, you have to take care of your grandfolks, you know, whatever the, these duties are that are non-negotiable. But it is imperative to find some balance though too, because a life lived without the little joys, the things that we love doing is, is a really hard life to live. And I think that's where we see, you know, the greater um, manifestation of depression and negative mood, because, you know, when, when life has kind of lost its joy, it's really easy to have a kind of a downward, downward spiral. So it's, it's really critical to make some time to take care of yourself and to, and to do some things you love. Dr. Gillum, would you like to add to that? 
Sure. It's amazing how skilled we are, too, at allocating all of our resources to things around us. And we tend to forget uh, a fair amount about our own self-care and the importance of that. And so I just think the day-to-day -day stress, particularly in the, the in social environment that we're in right now, is a, is a real contributor to lack of, social, of emotional wellness. And so, you know, I like to always encourage uh, folks that I work with to be um, engaging in, in stress management techniques that, that we can absolutely have some control over and can have huge impact on our on our emotional wellness. So things like getting out and, and moving and exercising, uh, making sure that we're getting good sleep, keeping those social connections. Uh, it's very, very um, it, common for folks when they're uncomfortable emotionally to want to avoid things and to isolate because there is some element of comfort that comes with isolation. But I think we got to be real careful how we define what's comfortable uh, because what's comfortable can be debilitating long term if we're not careful. So, um, you know, I think self-care is something that we have to be uh, keeping our eyes on and making sure we're allocating time every day to doing something to take care of ourselves. Dr. Steiner, do you want to? I, um, Dr. Hassett and Dr. Gilliam have summed it up really well. I think the only thing I would add with this idea of self-care and building in time for joy is I like to talk about it in terms of just being aware of your personal values. You know, what are the things in your life that really sum up kind of what you want to stand for, kind of what is important to you as an individual? Because um, I to the point that was made earlier, when we get carried away with all of the things we have to do or need to do, or just managing the day in, day out of, um, you know, the pain sometimes, all of the things we care about can go to the wayside. And if you really can identify what is important to you as an individual and make time to spend a little bit of effort in that direction on a regular basis, the, the results are just incredible because then you feel like yourself even when everything else is out of control. You've all talked a little bit about this idea of our thoughts and the self-talk that we might have with ourselves. And what are some of the ways that you help people reframe their thinking when they do get stuck in some of these patterns? I can jump in real quick if that's okay. I, I think the first step is getting people to even recognize that it's happening. Um, we say some pretty awful things to ourselves sometimes, particularly during stress when we're down on ourselves. So even just a frank recognition of, of some of that dialogue that's playing on loop in our minds on a day-to-day -day basis when we're struggling in and of itself can be powerful. Just seeing it on paper and writing it down um, is in and of itself therapeutic for a lot of folks. And then actually getting having an opportunity to be able to take a look at those thinking thoughts. And one, are they helpful? And two, are they even fair and balanced? And, and so I think the first step is just the insight that it's even happening it's it just is often not there I, I, I like I like what you're saying there. And, and it makes so much sense that we're often so much tougher on ourselves than we are on anybody else and you know I, I recommended that people become aware of the self-talk and then how would they say these same things to their best friend. <laughs> you would never say those things to your best friend or they wouldn't be your best friend for long, yet we speak to ourselves that way. So it's becoming aware and then thinking about the new ways that we can, that we can um, speak to ourselves. There's a, um, a, a book by Ethan Cross called Chatter and it, it really beautifully describes you know, this, this inner dialogue and, and, you know, and how to think about it differently and, and how destructive it can be if, if the chatter is doing nothing but telling you um, bad things. I think it's also important to recognize that some of that chatter, and I love that word because that really is just mental kind of chatter and, um, ridiculousness that can sometimes happen inside of our own minds. It sometimes it gives you thoughts that are unhelpful about yourself, but sometimes it can also give you thoughts that are unhelpful in terms of your behaviors. You know, it can feel really, as Dr. Gilliam was saying, it can feel really comforting to say, I'm just going to pull back for a little while. Um, but in the long run, that may not get you where you want to go in life. That may not get you the connections that you're seeking that are good for your mental illness as, as well. So I think being aware of it, I think asking, is this thought helping or hurting me? And I've also found for some people, 
it can actually help to get some distance from it. So to almost imagine that your mind is separate from you and that it's your mind giving you all of this chatter or there's um, a mental monster, if you will, giving you all of this chatter. For some people that can be really helpful um, to say, you know, it, it's not me generating these unhelpful thoughts about me. It's just junk my mind is giving me and I don't have to respond to it in the way that I used to. So that can be helpful too. And also in the context of chronic pain management, how we think about our pain and its impact on us and what it holds for our future, let's not kid ourselves, is a, a very significant uh, predictor of how well people are going to function with their pain long term. Those, those thoughts and the language that we use are very, very powerful, uh, and they can cause people uh, to hurt more at just how they respond and think about their symptoms. So there's a, a real, the, that connection between how we think and how we feel physically and emotionally is an extremely powerful one. Yeah, I, I, that's so on the mark. And um, there's, you know, the, when we think about the neuroscience that, you know, of course, pain is processed in the brain and so are thoughts and so are emotions and many of the areas that process pain process thoughts and emotions. And so it, it's um, really clear that how, how we are thinking and how we are feeling can absolutely exacerbate our pain at the at the neural level, the level of the brain. So um, it's you know it it just adds another um, reason why it's important for us to become more aware of the things that we are thinking and the emotions that we are feeling and the um, likelihood that it could make our pain worse or certainly make our functioning worse. I know for many people, this might be particularly hard during this pandemic that we're all living in and, and, and even just all the things on the news, every, every time you tune in, there's some other thing that you have to be thinking about and that might be causing some other stress for you. And then when you're living with a chronic illness or maybe a mental health condition, it can feel like a lot and people can get pretty overwhelmed with that. I'm wondering if you've you've heard anything from your clients specifically about COVID or the pandemic and how that might be contributing to some of this. I mean, I can I can definitely speak to that. I, early on in the pandemic, I was hearing a lot from people who, you know, were really frustrated because appointments were getting canceled. This was before we all had figured out telehealth. Um, you know, there were delays in shipping of medications. There was a lot of, you know, a, a lot of factors beyond people's control that was directly impacting, you know, their engagement and care, but then also just the anxiety and the worry and the lack of knowing what was going to happen. Um, you know, that causes, as we were talking about physical changes in the body that can exacerbate pain. And so that was coming up a lot for people. Um, and, and really in a world where there's so much that's outside of our control and there's so little that we can predict, I often, you know, encourage people to emphasize to control the controllables and do what you can um, in terms, you know, there's a lot of aspects that you're gonna have no control over and worrying about it doesn't necessarily change it. But there, one thing you do have control over is your behaviors and the way that you respond to um, your emotions and your thoughts about these situations. So if you can, you know, build in a little bit more time for self-care or, you know, make sure that you're attending to your own needs a little bit better or pick up a healthy habit. Those things are within your control. And sometimes just doing one or two things um, that you made the decision to do can help to restore that sense of power in a world where we don't have a lot right now. <laughs> And I'd, I'd love to add to, um, to, to part of our self-care too, is to be a better consumer of the information we take into. Um, there's a lot of stressful information out there at, at many levels, including COVID and you know, world affairs. And um, thinking about how we want to take in inform information, it, it, is it reasonable to take in a little bit in the morning so you're up to date, but then not obsess on CNN for <laughs> the next eight hours? So yeah, so part of it dealing in this difficult time is also what you, um, how you consume information. 
And I might add too that we got to get creative too with how we can start to identify alternative social outlets too. I mean, the pandemic has closed things off to folks and has made it really challenging sometimes to engage in things that um, help with coping and help with stress management. And so getting really creative about how do we stay active? How do we engage in life knowing that there are going to be some of the things that we were typically doing pre-pandemic that are just not options for us. So being able to use our technology, um, for example, I've, I, I found myself when the gyms were closed, walking with my phone and um, actually zooming on my phone while I was walking with people. So being able to get some type of an outlet socially and exercise simultaneously. So we got it didn't help my data plan much, but it, it, we have to be thinking creatively about how we can start to tap into things that we need when those typical options uh, are not available to us. That brings us to the next point that we wanted to make sure that we covered was how people can prioritize their mental health. And you've already brought up several ways that people can start to do this, but is there, are there other tips that people want to throw out there for, for helping people really make this a priority? Yeah, I, I think people might be hesitant sometimes to do this because it feels like it's a big lift. Wow, now I'm going to have to set all this time aside to take care of me. And, and that's not the case. It's really quite remarkable what 10 or 15 minutes a day can do to help your mental health. Um, part of it is remembering to do that. So potentially putting some, you know, some sort of object or a note to remind you to do whatever this is that you want to do, um, whether it's an organized program or it's 10 minutes of listening to a guided imagery or it's going for a walk. Um, but you know, even 10 minutes can really make a difference if it's, you know, focused on breath or relaxation or, you know, just, just self-care. So it doesn't have to be um, like starting a major fitness program to run a marathon. And getting those things on your calendar, put them down on paper. There's something about having it actually on, pa on paper and holding yourself accountable to do it. It's going to increase the likelihood that you follow through with it. I would also say, if it is helpful to have like an accountability buddy, somebody that you're kind of making a similar change with, um, that can also be helpful. I, I have found that while it is very helpful to write things down on a piece of paper or set an alarm, sometimes it can also be easy to kind of ignore them or put them off or snooze that alarm. Um, I found that true for myself as well as people I work with. And so if you have somebody that's kind of in it with you, it's, it's harder to snooze that person or you know somebody's going to check in on you about it. I've also found it really helpful. All of you are therapists in some way, shape or form. And I've found it really helpful to have a therapist during this time and to have that dedicated space where you can say, okay, during this time, I'm going to focus on myself and my mental health, because sometimes we don't do it the rest of the time. So that can be also just really helpful for people. Yeah, it's a great point. Now I think we're gonna move into talking about the Arthritis Foundation tool that we have to, to integrate here a little bit about how people can try to find these time, this time and work on finding new skills for your emotional health. We are really trying to focus on prioritizing mental health because physical health often takes the it kind of steals the scene sometimes, especially when we're talking about arthritis, we're talking about chronic disease. It can really be just about that physical piece. But as we've heard here already, our emotional health really does interact and can affect our physical health. So if we don't take account of that piece, we won't probably be able to get as far as we'd like to with our physical health as well. And that's why we are trying to help everybody with these self-care ideas and tips in order to, to make that a priority. So I think we're gonna move into talking about the VIM app. And I believe there's some slides. Yep, here they come. So wonderful when things just happen. <laughs> when they're supposed to, yay. Okay, so this is VIM and this is the Arthritis Foundation's new goal setting app. And it can help you form all sorts of different habits but emotional health is one of the habits and goals that you can work on with this app. And more than 
9,600 people have already downloaded this app and are, are working on thousands of goals. There's already over 34,000 goals that people have set to help them manage their arthritis, including some emotional health pieces. And in the app, you can track your pain, you can track your symptoms, you can set realistic and obtainable goals to help manage your arthritis. And then you can also get support from other people who are living with arthritis. All of that can be done right in this one app. And it also has expert educational content that have evidence-based strategies to help you as you're learning how to set these goals and obtain these goals. And here's a short video that is going to help explain a little bit more about the app. When you download the free VIM app from the Arthritis Foundation, you'll be able to set achievable goals. Congratulations, Janice. You hit your goal. I knew you could do it. While also becoming a member of a community that offers encouragement. Janice, you're doing so much better. Thanks for saying that. Ready to go to lunch? Wouldn't miss it. Download the free VIM app from the Arthritis Foundation and start taking back what chronic pain has taken away. When you download the free And now the Arthritis Foundation has started this quest that's called the VIM Quest. And this is designed to help participants build these intentional daily habits to foster better emotional health and improve quality of life. Each week, in during six weeks of the quest, there's going to be new self-care tools that are critical for improving confidence and the ability to manage pain, build resiliency, and alleviate stress and reduce caregiver burnout. The six week quest will only be available through the app. So you have to download it if you wanna access all these tools. If you've already downloaded the app, you don't have to do anything. It will show up on your home screen. You just have to click it and say that you wanna join. And if you haven't yet signed up for Vim, now would be a great time to do so. When searching for the VIM in your app store, you have to type in VIM and the word arthritis in order to find the app. And you can learn more about how to download the app at arthritis.org backslash VIM, V-I-M. The types of habits formed in the VIM quest are rooted in proven mind-body practices and behavioral interventions, many of which we've talked about here tonight. And now I'm gonna hand it off to Dr. Hassett to explain a little more about these interventions and how they can contribute to your success. Okay, let me see if I can share my screen here. Here we go. All right. Can everybody see the slides? Yes, all righty. So I've been asked to talk to you just briefly about different behavioral interventions for improving pain, functioning, and emotional well-being. This is just a little bit of an overview about common interventions that we, um, that we use and some elements that you will find in the VIM and the, um, the six-week challenge. So just a quick um, disclosure, I am a consultant for Happify, and um, most of my funding and salary support comes from the National Institutes of Health and the um, Rheumatology Research Foundation and University of Michigan. So what we'll do is we'll talk a little bit about what we call treatment targets for behavioral interventions, things that improve when we use behavioral uh, approaches. We'll talk about um, common evidence-based behavioral interventions, so therapies that you might have heard about um, and maybe don't know um, a lot about. And then lastly, I'll just touch on briefly, where does behavioral self-care fit in? So when we think about the things that'll improve with behavioral self-care and self-management, um, it's, the, it's the skills that can be obtained that will help us um, be able to become more physically active. And one of the ways that we can address that is by decreasing our fear of movement, concerns that we might re-injure ourselves when frequently with chronic pain that is less of a concern. Um, certainly these interventions can help improve pain, it's what they're directed towards, but also they can improve sleep and mood. And interestingly, when you improve sleep, pain often gets better. When you improve mood, 
pain often gets better. I mean, and then when you improve pain, sleep and mood get better. It's a very interesting triad. If you improve one, the others tend to improve well. And then certainly the goal is to improve the health-related quality of life for people who have illnesses. And then of course, the sum, what we're gearing towards is having these skills to enhance our overall res resilience and well-being. So I'm going to talk about several different types of therapies and the granddaddy of them all are behavioral therapies. This goes back to the 1930s and 40s when the thought was that behaviors um, are the key to everything. And if we can identify and change unhealthy behaviors, that would be the goal to improvement. And because the belief is that all behaviors are learned, it gives us the path to unlearn them. So with behavioral therapy, the target is to change unhelpful behaviors that limit our functional status. And the skills that are taught in behavioral therapies include relaxation, that could be paced breathing. It could be listening to guided imageries or elements of meditation. It could be progressive muscle relaxation that involves tensing and releasing muscles to help improve um, muscle tension. It could be sleep hygiene, which is teaching people how to better promote um, or how to promote better sleep habits, how to identify the things that you might do that get in the way of sleeping well. Activity pacing is another skill that is often taught, and that's how to take a task on in a way that won't flare your pain. And then, of course, problem solving, how to deal with the things in your life so that you can make time and space um, for self-care. So behavioral therapy um, is the basis of cognitive behavioral therapy, but cognitive behavioral therapy takes into account the importance of our thoughts. So the central premise is that the most important element is not the event, but it's actually how the person perceives the event and that will influence how they behave. So the goal is to help people identify um, unhelpful thinking patterns and find more adaptive thought patterns and behaviors. So let me give you an example. Um, so let's say there's an event. Let's say it, it, I'm in Michigan and this is something we just had as recently as last week with big old snowy um, car backup on the highway. And let's say that's the event that you're stuck in. You'll have some thoughts about that. And if your thoughts are, I hate traffic, I hate Michigan, I hate snow, you're likely to have feelings that result from those thoughts. And the feelings of I hate Michigan, I hate snow, it's probably anger. And when we have these types of thoughts and emotions, we tend to behave. And in that case, this could be road rage. But given the same exact circumstance, a different set of thoughts like, huh, well, I'm stuck in traffic and it's kind of great because I've got a few minutes of quiet. There's nobody, you know, hounding me at work. This is kind of good. And you know what? Those thoughts will often inspire a different emotion, maybe even a little bit of happiness. And when those thoughts and emotions are on board, your behavior is likely to be more adaptive, like perhaps putting on some music or a fun show to listen to on the radio. So with cognitive behavioral therapy, really the goal is to identify some dysfunctional thought patterns and behaviors that chatter we were speaking about earlier and help people come up with new, more adaptive ways to think. We call that reframing. So in cognitive behavioral therapy, you will have a combination of behavioral therapy techniques like relaxation and activity pacing that we talked about before and, and sleep hygiene, but also these cognitive strategy, strategies like helping you identify thoughts that are not only not helpful, but um, perhaps um, really detrimental Detrimental. There's a focus on goal setting and problem solving and pleasant activity scheduling, as we all alluded to, the importance of having positive activities actually scheduled into your life. And then um, cognitive behavioral therapy is kind of the second granddaddy, but um, CBT has babies. And of course, I look for any excuse to show baby Yoda. But um, The babies that kind of came from cognitive behavioral therapy are mindfulness-based therapies like mindfulness-based stress reduction and mindfulness-based cognitive therapy. There's another, um, another offspring called acceptance and commitment therapy or referred to as ACT. And then of course, positive psychology. So I'm gonna talk about each of these briefly just to give you a sense of what they are. So we've heard a lot about mindfulness over the last 10 years or so. And really all it is, is just an awareness that arises through paying attention purposefully and on the present moment, being non-judgmental on your thoughts as they pass through your brain and knowing 
and understanding and accepting kind of what is on your mind. In mindfulness-based therapies, the target is really mind and body awareness, how the two, the mind and the body interact and how the mind can drive these negative physiological effects. They can drive stress, muscle tension, pain, and even Ill, you know, even um, how we behave with our illnesses. Mindfulness is geared towards promoting serenity and clarity, having a more joyful life, and really trying to um, access the, our own internal resources for healing. And some of the skills you would learn in mindfulness is just kind of a non-judgmental awareness of daily life, of being able to sit with your thoughts and think about them almost like a scientist. Think, that's an interesting thought that just went by. I don't need to act on it, but, and it doesn't have to be true, but fascinating. Um, mindfulness teaches you how to become more aware of your body in a similar way, in a non-judgmental um, way of becoming aware of the various things happening in your body. Here too, progressive muscle relaxation can be used and even mindfulness meditation. So meditation isn't always involved in mindfulness, but it can be a, a key part of practice. Next, a commitment, um, acceptance and commitment therapy or ACT. Here, the basic premise is that emotions are there. We have them. We have lots and lots of negative emotions as human beings. And the goal is not to avoid them, to be aware of them. It's no longer necessary to deny or to struggle with these emotions. Instead, the goal is to kind of accept that these emotions are appropriate responses to living with chronic illness or living with it in a difficult other situation, that they are just here. And that if we fight these feelings, if we can't feel this, or we don't, we don't want to be angry, we don't want to be frustrated. The more we fight the feelings, the, the worse they become. So acceptance and commitment therapy says that the goal is to accept these emotions and pain and to commit to making necessary changes in behavior to live a life that is more rich and more interesting and, um, and that you can feel better about. It, in the case of pain, it's permission to put pain on the back burner so that you can go on and, and live your life. And some of the strategies in acceptance and commitment therapy involve kind of just listening to your self-talk, your chatter, non-judgmentally, like a scientist, again, a little bit like mindfulness, to decide if an issue really requires action or change. Because you know what? Sometimes when we get to sit back and watch our thoughts go by, we might actually realize, hey, there's something I can do something about. That is something that I can act on. Um, it encourages you, ACT encourages you to make a commitment to stop fighting these past emotions and your, and your past worries and concerns and start practicing to make a more optimistic and confident um, view of the world that can impact your behavior um, in a more positive way. And then lastly, kind of where I dwell is within the field of positive psychology and the very useful tools that are positive activity interventions. These are awesome because they're fun. These are what we refer to as resilience-based um, activities that actually improve positive emotions and well-being just by doing them. Um, in the field of positive psychology, we focus, yes, on negative emotions and behaviors, but we view positive emotions and positive behaviors as equally, if not more important in one's life. And, and there are ways to help you get to, get to enjoying your life more. And so the premise is that enjoying, um, engaging in enjoy, in joyful and pleasant activities um, is really critical to, to your, your health, to enjoy the good things in life. And by doing this, we often find that there is a significant decrease in the experience of pain, the unpleasantness of pain and improved functioning. So what are the tools? Um, positive reflection, you know, versus rumination. Again, thinking about negative things over and over again, being able to put a stop to that, lean back and think about what was good? What did I learn from that? What could work for me from that negative thing? Um, using your character strengths, we all have them. We probably know what they are, be it creativity or wisdom or courage or kindness, and using those in new ways in our life, finding how to take our inner strengths and, um, and really put them forward to the forefront. Um, there's a focus on purpose and meaning in life within um, the field of positive psychology, that a life worth living is really quite valuable, and to identify what that is and what steps can be taken to move you towards a pur your, your purpose. And then certainly engaging in rewarding and, acti and, and um, fun activities. Um, as mentioned before, pleasant, um, pleasant activity scheduling is one. 
Um, but gratitude activities, keeping a journal or writing somebody a, a letter of, of, um, of gratitude, um, conducting acts of kindness, just random acts of kindness, um, doing a, several of them all in one day and planning them, savoring, spending a moment to enjoy a, a minute of um, being with a friend or a cup of coffee or the sunshine on your face, but really finding something that brings you joy and just spending a moment in being with it. Um, there's a number of other um, interventions too, too long to list, but certainly positive service is incredibly powerful as is, um, as is practicing optimism. And so I just wanted to include um, a recent meta-analysis, which means a study of all studies that have been conducted in the area. And it showed for chronic pain that these little simple positive activities like acts of kindness and, and writing gratitude letters can result in decreased pain intensity, fewer depressive symptoms, less pain catastrophizing or negative thinking, um, less negative emotion and improve, improve positive emotion. So they are quite effective and they can be, and the effects can be quite, quite long, um, quite long lasting. So now that we've kind of hopefully set some of the premise for you that changing some of these behaviors, our thoughts, and some of our emotions can be helpful, um, I want to just um, really tout the remarkable um, opportunity to engage in a little bit of behavioral self-care. So behavioral self-care, behavioral self-management is what we strive for in our therapeutic interventions, that we don't just want to treat you for eight weeks and have you go away. We want you to take the skills, practices, new knowledge, and new ways of being um, with yourself and in your life and practice them forever. So learn these skills. And um, with this, I think I'm going to turn it over back to talk about VIM and the six-week quest. And thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Hess. I, I love how those strategies are fun. <laughs> a lot mm -hmm. of times people think that when you're doing this type of work that it has to be painful or not going to be very much fun. So I thank you for that. Before we move on to talking about some other successful strategies for setting goals for your emotional health, we're going to share a little bit more about the upcoming quest and the features that are involved in the six week program. And I think we have a slide coming up here too that we'll talk about each of the weeks. There we go, great. And as mentioned, each week has activities that will focus on key factors that we know affect mental well-being. And here are the different factors here and the different activities that are associated with each week. So week one is called Take 30. And this first week is all about getting in the routine of caring for yourself, establishing a habit to spend at least 30 minutes of day on self-care will help set you up for success for the following weeks. And week two, tired of being tired. Yes, many of us feel this way. <laughs> so emotional well-being is closely linked to sleep and fatigue problems, getting tips for better rest and build habits that will promote vitality. Week three is get your move on. This is about physical activity and how it is key to maintaining your emotional well being and can release pain fighting, feel good chemicals called endorphins. And if you're new to working out, there's no need to do too much. You can just do 15 minutes and you'll start seeing a difference probably right away. Week four is called slow your roll. And this week is about taking time to slow down. Actively cultivate moments of peace, as Dr. Hassett was just talking about, and learning ways to rewire negative thought patterns and behaviors. Learn about and engage in mindfulness practices like yoga, tai chi, meditation, and mindful eating. Week five is connect and thrive. This week, you'll be encouraged to tend to your current relationships, as well as take steps to create a support system for times of need. And week six is putting it all together. For week six, you'll apply what you've learned to create a well-rounded week of self-care and build a personalized toolbox of strategies that worked for you. The VimQuest also has some tools and features that are gonna help you stay motivated and engaged. 
And here are a few of the prompts that you'll see in the quest. Explore. The quest contains a library of content that reflects weekly themes. And here you'll get video, audio, and articles that will help you learn more about self-care and mental health strategies, many of the ones that we're talking about tonight. Connect, a major part of the quest is fostering emotional health through connection. Throughout the quest, you're encouraged to cheer on and make friends with other quest users. So there's a sense of that community building built right into the app. For do, each week you're encouraged to engage in one self-care activity per day. And you can choose from a thorough drop-down list of all sorts of su suggested activities. And then feel free to choose your own also if you don't like any of those ones. For achieve, each week you will complete in the quest, you'll receive a badge to keep you motivated. And pre-post survey. Before beginning the quest, you'll take a survey to gauge your mood, which is important to track your progress. And at the end of the quest, you'll revisit to see if you've improved. If your mood hasn't improved or has worsened, this is a good indicator that it's time to talk to your doctor and get a referral for a mental health professional. And once again, as we mentioned, the quest starts today. And just a note, if you're already a user and in the middle of a goal, feel free to start whenever you like. You can finish your goal and then start the challenge, pause your goal and start the challenge, or complete the challenge while also tackling the goals you've already set. There's no wrong way to do this. So now that we've discussed ways to improve emotional health, let's talk about some strategies to stay motivated and on track with those goals. So I'd like to open it back up to our speakers here to, to put out some ideas for these strategies and ways, we've covered some of them already, but ways that people can, can try to work towards these goals. Looks like you're ready, Dr. Hassan. <laughs> I was going to defer to others because I was just speaking a lot. So really, oh, that's fine too. Dr. Steiner, do you want to share some thoughts? Um, yes. I uh, Sorry, I was having some issues with the mute and the, turning my camera back on, so I apologize. Um, I think the biggest thing to remember is that whenever you're making any kind of change or setting a goal, to start small. You know, I think there's a tendency to get really ambitious and really excited and want to make a big change. Um, and that sometimes um, that can actually be overwhelming. And so it's better to kind of break it down into smaller steps, more manageable kind of bites of the goal, if you will. And that way it can really kind of help build, build your confidence. You know, there's a ton of research that shows that anytime you're trying to make any kind of change in your behavior, um, it's more likely that you're gonna be successful if you have confidence in your ability to actually do it. And so one way to build that confidence is just making it more manageable um, and more achievable. So that would be a really good place to start, I would say. You know, I, I might also add, uh, you know, having compassion, uh, self-compassion. I think sometimes in this process of trying to move towards what's important in our lives, we fall off track. I think that's mm -hmm. to be expected on some levels. So the, the, the goal should never be to be perfect. But uh, when we do fall off track, the quicker we can recognize that that's happening and get ourselves back uh, on the right direction is really is really the, the, the key here. So I think some compassion, even if things aren't going just as you want them to go, that doesn't mean it's, in a, it's a, a failed trial. Um, and just working to get back on track. Absolutely. I'm always telling people, you know, every day is a new opportunity to get back on track, you know, rather than letting a slip up or a, a fall off of your track, if you will, set you mm -hmm. back at zero, you've mm -hmm. still got that progress path um, and you can get back on. Yeah, you know, and, and, and failure is such a negative word. We all do it all the time. It's okay to slip up and, or, you know, skip a day or whatever you do. And, you know, having that self-compassion to, to forgive yourself or, okay, well, that happened and now I'm back and to be okay with that and, and know that it's just human, that we have fits and starts and stops and starts and, and it's just, it's really okay. And I know that there's, all sorts of roadblocks that come up for people. So it could be time. Mm -hmm. People are juggling a lot of different things, pain or arthritis mm -hmm. flares, or just 
trying to keep your day-to-day -day stuff running in your house and your job, do you have any specific solutions maybe for some of these? If people are really struggling with the time piece or really struggling with the pain piece, anything you want to dig into those a little bit? Well, I think I can get started from the from a time perspective. I think it, it sometimes we're going to have to make tough decisions about how do we prioritize things, mm -hmm. and um, making sure that we're prioritizing ourselves. I think when we take a good hard look at the things that we want to get done on a daily basis, there's often opportunities for some things that are a little bit lower on the on the ladder to be something that we could maybe put off till tomorrow and we could do that tomorrow and make sure that we're focusing on ourselves and, and giving ourselves time to be able to to, to engage in self-care so so it's it's an obvious struggle for for many but if we take the time to really look and prioritize things uh, often there are opportunities that we're missing and sometimes you know even talking to the people in your life to you know to see if you can get them on board you know, talking to your your kids or your spouse or the people you work with and say, hey, I'm doing this for the next six weeks. This is really important to me. You know, please cheer me on, but I may not have dinner on the table on time or, you know, and just, and, you know, set the expectation. This is something that you're doing now and, and how it might affect things, but hey, you're going to be bigger and stronger and better for having um, gone through the, you know, the, the self-care. Those are great suggestions. I think you mentioned, you know, what do you do if it's a bad pain day? I think when you're dealing with a bad pain day, it's easy to say, oh, I'll deal with that when I feel better. Um, I think it's a natural response. And engaging in self-care on those bad pain days is probably one of the most important things you can do for all the reasons we've been talking about. Because um, when your emotional well-being suffers, it exacerbates your pain and it gets you stuck in that pain cycle of everything just starts feeling more and more out of control. And so if you can remember that doing it is actually in service of getting you to a place of feeling better physically and emotionally, I think that that can help. Yeah, you know, and how, you know doing the, on, the, on the worst of days, if you do one joyful thing, one kind thing, then that day is not a waste right? Something special or good happened on that day. So um, again, that, that is self-care. We have some questions coming in here too. So I'm going gonna, gonna to take a couple of those and put them out there. How do I stop agonizing about the fact that my arthritis pain is only going to get worse? I don't know if anyone has a brilliant idea for that one. I think it's a lot easier said than done. And I think the first thing is to recognize that agonizing over it or being upset about it, or it, that's part of, I think, the experience of being human and living in pain. Um, that doesn't mean that it has to control every aspect of your life. You know, the, uh, lots of the strategies that we've been talking about can help you to recognize, okay, I'm having, I'm feeling overwhelmed by this, or I'm worrying about the future or how bad it could be. Those are thoughts that my mind is giving me. How can I redirect some of my energy into something joyous, into something that gives me purpose? And, uh, and sometimes you can do that on your own or with the help of the app and some of the strategies in there. And sometimes you might need a little extra help. And that's where sometimes going to therapy specifically for you know managing the impact of the, the pain or the illness can be really helpful um, to just kind of make it personalized and guide it for you. I've also found as somebody, I have juvenile arthritis. I've been living with it for almost 40 years. And I have found that I, for me personally, I had to get into those negative emotions a little bit. I had to work my way through them in order for me to get not entirely to the other side, but for them, it's like my muscles. I have to build up my muscles in order to, to be able to see things more positively. And that was a hard time for me, but that really helped me to be able to actually process and get out some of those negative emotions so that I could, it, it felt like a weight had been lifted mm. off me. And then we have another question here. How can we best support ourselves if we don't have a support system? That's a hard one. That's a hard one. So um, I often have people kind of draw 
their support system around them, who, who all there is. And sometimes we forget who is there, <laughs> that there are other people that we can kind of recruit in. And then there's also identifying the people who really are not supportive and thinking, how can I re reprioritize my, my effort and my energy towards building the people around us? And then sometimes it's scary because it does mean that you might need to reach out that you might reach out to, to a therapist, to a group, to even you know, joining a knitting circle or just something different and taking that first step to build that social support, the one, the one that, you know, that you want, that, you know, that, that you, um, the people in your life that are sustaining and supportive. Yeah, to, to build those social networks, we have to access them. And so, you know, being willing to get, this may be a goal, a self-care goal or a recovery goal is to, to go to a coffee shop, to find a volunteer opportunity, something that's going to give you access to some social reinforcement. And that's really where it all starts. Uh, and, and remember, when, when it comes to social support, uh, the buffering effect of social support on wellness is not necessarily the number of people that you have in your network, it's the quality of the relationships. So even if we're able to, to, to get connections with one, two people, um, having a strong connection just with that few people can have a real significant impact long term. But we got to get out there and start looking for them because they're not just going to show up at our door. And the Arthritis Foundation does have some support groups. They're called connect groups. And those can be hugely important. And some many of them are virtual now too, where there's options to do in-person and virtual. And those can be a great first step for people. I know for myself also, when I was younger and I had never met anybody else with my disease, that was life-changing to finally meet somebody else and understand that you're not alone. And you can build great friendships through those also that may have nothing to do with arthritis. So sometimes you, you have that disease specific support and then other times it can be for fun. And that's also really important also. And we have another question here. How do you maintain self-worth when you are unable to contribute financially or around the house because of pain? I feel like a burden because everyone has to help me. So I think that is an incredibly common experience for people who, who are dealing with arthritis or other types of pain um, because it does get in the way. That said, it can be helpful to start thinking about, you know, what exactly does self-worth mean to you? Um, I think in our society, we think about it as providing financially or being able to do tangible tasks, but there may be other ways to be a contributor in your household or in your family. Perhaps that's emotional support. Perhaps that's, you know, engaging in some kind of fun um, connectedness activity. It doesn't have to look exactly the way that it looked before the pain was a problem or the way you had it in your head. Um, and that can take some adjusting of expectations. It's not, it, I'm making it sound much easier than it actually is. But I do think that, you know, working on reevaluating what that definition of self-worth looks like and finding small ways to still feel like you're contributing can be, um, can be useful for some people. You know, and also recognizing, you know, what are the thoughts that are kind of driving <laughs> that feeling of, of, um, of lot, lack of self-worth? That's, um, you know, I, I, I'm concerned that, you know, that those are very depressive thoughts and that's something that when people are depressed, they, that's one of the first things that goes is the sense of self-worth that everything kind of seems to, to sink around that. So, um, you know, I, I, I so agree that um, society values certain things. And um, if we fall into that trap, that the only thing that's valuable is X, Y, and Z, it's going to be very hard to have a chronic illness and, you know, do these things that we think society asks of us. But then instead of reevaluating what is really important to you, I mean, how many people on the deathbed said, yeah, I wish I worked more days, right? What's important to us often isn't these achievements. It is building these relationships and the kindness, the things that we do on a regular basis that um, are not our, our, um, our vocations. I'm looking at, we've got a couple of questions that there's some overlap. So I might, I might go to this relationship one here about arthritis has affected my relationships 
My partner thinks that I'm faking and using my pain as an excuse to not be intimate. Same with my friends. They think it's an excuse to not be around them. Any thoughts? Boy, that's really complicated um, and, and, and tough to, to respond to without having all of the, of the full context. Um, I'll say with respect to just engagement with our, with our peers and our social network, um, it, uh, sometimes getting out there and giving that a try and, and making some types of connections can have really powerful impact on mood more so than you might think. Um, I, I would encourage people uh, who are a bit isolated and, and not as interactive with their peer network as they'd like to be or that their peers would like them to be to consider engagement, even if it's for a very brief period, uh, brief period of time, even if it's just 15, 30 minutes, something like that. What we, what I tend to experience with, with some of the folks that I work with is when they get out there and they, they actually get into the social environment, they start to feel better. And just that distraction itself, uh, they're actually able to tolerate it longer than they initially think they were. And it has all sorts of positive effects on, on not only their mood state, because the more connected we are with folks, the, the better our mood ends up getting. But it's, it's funny how it also impacts people's perception of their pain. And what I mean by that is that they're not thinking about it as much. They're not feeling it as much because they're engaged in something that's more value to them. And I think the piece about your relationship with your partner, that is also really common that it, it's almost like there's another person in your relationship when you have a chronic disease. And, and sometimes it can feel awkward and uncomfortable and trying to navigate around that. But the only way to do that is usually to talk about it. And to sometimes you need extra help outside of the relationship also, but it is, you got to get into those thoughts and feelings a little bit and start to break them down so that you can rewire and, and come at it from a different angle. Mm -hmm. And it's hard. <laughs> Just like everybody has said, this all sounds easier. I, I've been through this with my own husband too. It, it can be very hard, but it is possible. It's possible. We had another question here. Are there any supplements that can help with depression or anxiety? It's not really my area, so I'm not sure what the evidence is. I don't know if the other two know more about and there's been a lot of work in St. John's wards and some other um, supplements that had actually some pretty good science, scientific uh, studies. I don't know much more than that, other than to, to say that it's a little bit outside of our scope. Um, yeah, I would agree with that. But I'm, it's a, of course, my bias being a psychologist is I'd, I'd rather try to see if we can't work on ways that people can make behavior change and cognitive changes to improve their mood state as opposed to feeling like they need to reach for something in order to feel better. I think there's there's some pl there's a place for that, but I also think there's some real risk if we're not careful. Um, so trying to help people self-regulate their mood through their own lifestyle changes to me is always a more desirable approach to take than a supplement or um, something like that. It can be really helpful also to talk to your doctor, your primary care doctor or your rheumatologist about that question, because sometimes supplements can also help with things that might not seem to be related but could be affecting your mood or could be affecting your sleep or those different pieces. So if they understand your health from a, a bigger perspective, they might be able to think through those different pieces with you too. And then how can we pursue activities or physical activity that we enjoy when so many things are being shut down with COVID or my disease prevents me from being able to participate like others? Well, hopefully things are starting to lift a little bit. And, and you know, if you're from a cold weather state, we're starting to see some sunshine <laughs> and getting out a little bit. And, you know, it, it, again, it doesn't have to be an all or nothing. So uh, if there is a wonder drug, it might be exercise. <laughs> it, it incredibly powerful for mood and for pain and for uh, sleep and fatigue. And, you know, I think often we put this rule on what exercise needs to be and exercise can be as simple as just going for a walk outside and the data are actually getting quite good for being in nature so even just walking amongst trees and and being in, you know in green and feeling a little sunshine on your face 
that, you know, I, I think is, is a wonderful start. And there might be days it, it doesn't make sense to walk, but um, maybe that's the day that you just walk out a little bit and get some sunshine on your face. We have a couple questions here about grief and different directions of grief. So one about grief and not being able to handle the things we were once able to do. And then another one is somebody is experiencing grief from losing their husband and wondering if that grief is affecting their arthritis or their physical health. I will try to tackle that. Um, I will say in terms of the first piece with grief over kind of the loss of being able to do things that you were once able to do or do them in the way that you anticipated doing them, that is a very normal part of this experience. And I will say, you know, for people that are dealing with um, pain, it's an, it can sometimes be an ongoing experience. And I you know, you may grieve it for a while and then things get better and then you have a flare and you kind of have to go through the grieving again. Um, and I think the best that you can do is allow yourself to and have some compassion for yourself. Um, and then, you know, recognize if you're getting stuck in it um, because you wouldn't want to hang out there for too long. Um, but it's okay to feel that way. It's, it is part of this process. And for the second piece, I would say, you know, without knowing the individual and working through it more um, tailored to the person asking the question, it's possible, right? Grief does come with some physical effects. And so it is possible that that could contribute to a pain flare, but um, we don't know for sure. And our last question here is pain, depression, and fatigue seem to be related. Is it best to tackle all three at once or separately? Anyone want to take that one? I'll jump in on that because I kind of alluded to something similar before that, you know, kind of thinking about what I think about as a triangle between pain, fatigue, and mood. I'm sorry, pain, sleep, and mood. But fatigue works right in there too. I think we could put, you know, make an argument for a square. And, um, you know, there are some studies that kind of suggest that these all might be a similar central nervous system, you know, brain mediated process. And so um, tackling them all at once is, is hard. Um, sometimes you can sneak up on all of them by tackling one. So for example, if you are a poor sleeper and you can get your sleep regulated, through working with somebody or just you know doing practices that like we have in the in the app, and you get to sleeping very often. The fatigue, the cognitive fogginess, the pain, the mood will all improve. Same thing too if you have depression and that depression gets treated, um, and you start you know thinking less catastrophic thoughts or you you have a, a you're taking an antidepressant and, and and get to feeling better. Your sleep will usually get better, and then your cognition will get better, your thoughts will get better, and then your pain gets better. So. Sometimes the sneak attack on just getting on one of them, one that's, that might be the easiest, fatigue's the hardest, fatigue's hard to, <laughs> to address. But I think sleep is kind of the low hanging fruit. If you're a poor sleeper, that's a great place to start. And that's so true. And so many of the, of the evidence-based interventions uh, for, for depression, for pain, for sleep, all share very similar sort of theoretical underpinnings. And so if you directly target one thing with a particular skill, it's very generalizable uh, to the others as well. Well, I think that is going to conclude our discussion tonight. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you.